podcast that blend hip-hop culture and geek culture together i'm your boy deuces and this is one-on-one with deuces the place where i speak with creators curators and people that you should know and right now man we have a very very special guest somebody that we've been tracing tracking down for at least a year and a half two years now is one of the busiest men in hollywood but we have the man the myth the legend himself Laz alonzo how are you doing brother what's up what's up what's going on with you brother glad to be here Man, you know what? I am super excited. First things first, get it right out the rip. I have to give all praise and shout outs to Noriega and the Dream Champs. They make this normalized of giving people their flowers while they're here. And I want to talk about the work that you have been doing. So I know that you are very into Afro uh, Afrofuturism and everything like that. And you big up about that. And especially with you being an um, HBCU and you're just all about the advancement and movement of Black people. I want to make sure that you are aware of how much the black community appreciates your work and everything that you do from avatar to the boys and to being into these worlds of geekdom that and fandom and us being able to see you in these roles and not only just be like not not just like a background but have a major role and have an impact with the characters man we truly truly 100 love all the work that you do and everything that you give to this game and give to the world and we just want to make sure that you know from the blurred community that we appreciate you, man, for sure. Thank you so much, man. I appreciate that. You know, it means so much to me to be embraced and appreciated by the Blurs. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I got to know the Blurs and party with the Blurs and and, and toss up a few ones too with the Blurs. Yeah. Uh, Comic Con a few years ago uh, when we were first introducing the boys. And I had no idea that I had so much love and support, you know, from that community. And for me, it's important to always represent when I'm on camera, uh, I'm going to try to be uh, as heroic as possible, not just for me, but for everybody that looks like me and for everybody that I represent. You know what I'm saying? Um, I, I, I always try to find a way to give my character purpose. And uh, on this show specifically, which is a crazy, ridiculous show mm -hmm. with dark, dark, dark comedy undertones, yeah. you know, I use a lot of the character being the straight man as a way of being able to do some really risky things without compromising his integrity. Yeah. You know what I mean? Uh, 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 season two, you know, he got into a big altercation with, with a very long appendage. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And, and my thing was, how can I play that, but at the same time, not sacrifice, you know, the one black, strong black man on the show who's yeah. trying to do right. How do I continue to uphold that? You know? And so uh, having that OCD, to lean on and to learn how to play it and infuse it into every scene mm -hmm. uh, is something that has allowed him to keep his integrity as a character. Um, but I think like what defines uh, more Mother's Milk on the boys has been his moral his moral uh, standards. Yeah, you know, it's been his heart and it's been in spite of everything that's going on. Uh, he loves his daughter. Yep. An amazing father and that was also something that I, I sat down and i had many conversations with eric kripke who 100 percent agreed with me that we had to make him <clears throat> an exemplary black father yeah because as this show breaks stereotypes of all types yep. you know what i'm saying from from every area and every genre that's our goal um it was my goal to bring him certain stereotypes that i wanted broken from from the black community. And one of those were that black men are not good fathers. Right, yeah. And so, and and, and it, 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 what it ended up fusing into was the difficulty it is for black men to be present fathers when they have the weight of the world on their shoulders. Yeah. And literally the weight of the world is on mother's milk shoulders because they're trying to take down these superheroes who have powers while they don't have powers. Yeah. You know, and at the same time, not end up becoming as evil and as demented as them while they're doing it. So anyway, yeah. man, I'm not going <laughs> to get off my soapbox and let you run the interview. But it, I, I just appreciate you uh, shouting me out 
yeah. and, uh, and and showing me that kind of appreciation because I do put a lot of work into representing you properly and representing every black man that watches the show and black woman that watches the show. Y'all are gonna get a really good, yeah. y'all are gonna get some good treats this season. No, that's and that's the one thing about the character Mother's Milk that is so like just so dope about the character because like you you see like you say he's breaking those stereotypes, but I I love the fact that also he is he is like one of like the realest characters in this universe because he is truly like a fed up black man like bro I just want to I just want to help the youth and I want to be with my family fam like like so it's like it's so relatable because you know our patients run thin man like depending yeah. on it's like hey man all right like what we doing now and right. so I love that I love that about mother's milk I just how grounded he is it makes a character in this world if superheroes were real like that is so relatable or to somebody like look man all right, look, I, I'm going to help y'all, but listen, I'm not going to sacrifice myself and what I got for my family. That is numero, numero, number one. Like, that is that is the one. So I, I love how relatable he is. And, and you know, uh, Eric Kripke has given me the license to respond as a Black man from Harlem. Oh, man. You know, uh, and that's something that, that was very important to me. You know, sometimes you get scripts. Yeah. And, you know, everybody that writes a script isn't going to be a Black man from Harlem. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? It's, it's going to be a, a a white man from maybe Boston or a, a white woman that grew up in Southern California. So they may not necessarily know how a black man from Harlem would react to this particular situation. Right. But Eric Kripke has given me the trust to be able to rewrite um, some of my mother's milk dialogue and scenes so that it is as authentic as possible, especially when uh, mother's milk has monologues. Like, I don't know if you guys have noticed, but season one and season two, uh, there's at least one episode where Mother's Milk has a really long monologue. Yeah. And season three is going to have that as well. Um, now that season three is getting deeper into the Mother's Milk backstory, and we're going to find out a lot of things about him. Oh, um, wait. Yeah. And so, uh, uh, you know, he, he allows me that license to translate what they want to say, but in a way that when our community watches it, they'll believe it. Yeah. Be like, you know, because sometimes you watch stuff and be like, man, a black man would never say that. <laughs> right. You know, or, or a brother would never a brother would never walk into that dark building the way he is. Like that, that, ain't, even, that ain't even how we do things. Oh, you know? right. <laughs> and so you know what when I when I get the scripts and I read them and I dissect them as mother's milk. Yeah. You know, uh I, I pitch a whole bunch of ideas to Crip and uh and nine out of ten times you know uh he'll he'll incorporate them into the script whenever he doesn't mm -hmm. uh it's usually because of something that might be happening two or three scripts later that i don't even know of yet right. but he'll he'll break it down to me and he'll explain well you know if we go this way then it's going to affect these other dominoes yeah. that won't, we won't be able to circle back and we got this other stuff going on with this other character and so you know you know he's got to look at the whole universe whereas i'm looking at mother's right. milk's world and so, you know, we try to find the, the happiest medium to make it work. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Yeah. You know, sometimes it works the way that they had scripted it. And then when we get there on a day and we made all these changes, we're like, damn, you know what? The way they had written it is actually yeah. the way it's supposed to be. Yeah. And we go back to that. You know, so it's a, it's a lot of trial and error. But the beauty of it is, is that it's collaborative. Yeah. And, and you know, TV has evolved. Because I remember, you know, I mean, I've been doing this for a while. At one time, man, you couldn't collaborate in TV. Yeah, I heard, I heard about that. Yeah. yeah, one time it was like, whatever the writer writes, you just mm -hmm. say exactly what they say. You do exactly what they do, like talking heads, robots. Yeah. And that's it. Like, that, it, it, you just give it to them as a prepackaged thing. Yeah. And, you know, that's why a lot of actors at one time didn't want to do TV. Yeah. Because they were like, you know, like, yeah, it pays good money, but I, I, I have more to offer to this crowd. I didn't get into this crowd just to memorize words and regurgitate. Yeah. You know, but TV has evolved and streaming platforms and cable have made TV more like film. Yeah. You know, so instead of when you watch a series, what you're actually watching is a 10 to 16 hour film yeah. versus a, you know, a, a two hour 
film if you go to the movie theaters. Yeah, but see, that's what I love about like I think it was the with the uh, evolution of black led shows or black directed shows or black written shows. Um, you start trusting more into the actors. I remember hearing stories about like even something like you know the Boondocks, where like Samuel Jackson, that somebody there was uh, one of the uh, directors was saying like he would come in, he would say, look, I'm going to respect the writer, so I'm going to read exactly what the script is, but I'm also going to do my version of it. Cause I want you guys to see both and I guarantee you, you'll like my version. And they always went with Samuel Jackson version because as a actor, once you play a character, especially in a long lasting show or something like that, you start embodying that person. You start. And so now you know how that person is going to respond in this situation or this. So I love that like directors are now trusting in their actors who are the professionals who are living embodiment of this character and they're trusting in them to say okay how would this person i know i wrote it but now that you are living it how do you think naturally this person would respond and i think that that's what brings it to it and so we get to see that and because i know you said even with the ocd that was kind of like brought in through like how you were during the pandemic with the hand sanitizer and everything making sure before the pandemic i've been right. OCD for a minute <laughs> okay see right so it's like so now so it's like you know i love that the director even also able or, and the writers are able to see like okay what part of last and what part of mother milk can we blend together where it's still natural it doesn't take away from it but it also brings this character to a level of realism baby wipes, baby wipes. <laughs> now, that was my contribution you know right. like, thing was you know i carry baby wipes in my book bag i always have baby wipes in, in the bathroom you know what i'm saying you got to do a combination of dry wiping and wet wiping. You can't just dry wipe. You got a wet wipe too. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, right. So <laughs> and, and so uh, having those meetings with Kripke and being like, okay, yeah, you got the aloe uh, Purell, yeah. but, but there's another level to this OCD thing. Let me break it down to you. And I'll just right. open my bag up and start pulling out stuff. And, like, <laughs> and he's sitting there just taking notes because next thing you know, I get on stage and now Mother's Milk has everything that was in my bag. <laughs> we find ways to throw it in there you know what i'm saying yeah so now so in addition to that i i feel like your your graphic shirt choice now also has to have now got this own department now now it's like okay now let me figure out what she yeah there we go got that purple rain because like i said you you had and this is what i love like i said when we talk about like even our our podcast how we blend hip-hop culture and geek culture together a lot of people don't know how much both cultures go hand in hand so here you are on this superhero show this geeked out show but here you are rocking wu-tang shirts and you know rocking just like some of the most dopest hip-hop shirts and i i how did that come about? Because I, I don't, if I'm not mistaken, that wasn't in the comic lore or the nah. graphic novel lore. So like, where, how did that even come about? You know what, man? It was actually an accident. It was, <laughs> it, was it, it was a, it was a, a chosen accident. Let's put okay. it that way. So when we first started uh, trying to find Mother's Milk's look, uh, the first thing that Eric Kripke did not want was for us to all look the same. Right. You know, in the comic, everybody wears the the black trench coat, and everybody kind of is dressed uniformly. They look they look the same. Yep. He wanted every character to have a very distinct and unique look and color that represented their wardrobe. Okay. You know, so uh, Butcher was the only one with the black overcoat. You know, Huey got that green kind of little jacket with the yellow and uh, stripe on it. Um, the female has kind of like an army type black coat because it's kind of like you know she just kind of they just kind of we kind of grabbed the jacket for her on the go when we when we saved right. her and just gave it to her um and frenchie is kind of military dressed so it goes well that she's kind of military dressed too because they're they're a team yeah um and so my character it was like what what do we how do we dress him you know to give a he was in the military also yeah um but at the same time uh still give them that that harlem vibe that that harlem thing, yeah. you know and so i said okay a harlem brother is always going to have either some tims mm -hmm. or some fresh kicks yep and i felt like the kicks was important because a we're living in such a sneaker culture right now mm -hmm. that if we have the right kicks um then people are gonna naturally feel like it's speaking to them yep you know, like Tim's, okay, Tim's are cool, but you know, you can't change Tim's up. You know, right. Tim's are Tim's. 
But kicks, you could switch them up with the outfits. And I felt like what would be interesting about it is, is that I want I wanted people to ask, how does he keep his kicks so clean? <laughs> Like this motherfucker, this motherfucker got thrown into a whale. Right. You know so like my whole thing was like, and, and I've shot, you know, stuff hasn't even made the show because you know, when you try to condense all everything we shoot down to like an hour, 50 yeah. minutes, everything doesn't make the show. But like after the whale, when we're in the tunnels, Mother's Milk was cleaning his sneakers. So oh, like, okay. You know, he had his shirt off and he was like rubbing his sneakers in the tunnel. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So it's like it, it's it's just to show the pathology. Mm -hmm. of what it takes to remain sane in a very insane world. Yeah. And part of what I use as Mother's Milk's therapy is cleanliness. Oh, yeah. Yeah, we see that. Yeah. You know? And so, like, when he uses all this stuff, like, rubbing stuff off of him and everything, and, like, that that's how he deals with getting his frustrations out. Right. You know? um, The T-shirts. So the T-shirt started off as an homage to Harlem. Okay. So we started rocking all Harlem artists, you know, uh, Public Enemy, yeah. Fight the Power, mm -hmm. um, you know, like different New York. Really, it was New York artists. Yeah. It started with Harlem, and then we were like, all right, we gotta, we gotta grow this out more and start bringing in more, more New York artists. Yeah. And then we were like, man, this is bigger than just New York. This is an ode to hip hop. Mm -hmm. We gotta start speaking to other hip hop genres because we're literally representing hip hop in general, not just Mother's Milk is representing hip hop. Yes, he is, man. You know what I'm saying? So so we got to open this up and start really shouting out different regions, you know, yeah. New Orleans, Texas, Atlanta, you know, in addition to New York, DC, yeah. Delaware, like Philly, there's so much hip hop, LA, there's so much hip hop that added to pop culture. Yep. That we said, all right, we got to start really blowing this out because it's really taking on a life of its own, you know? And so it was a matter of taking these shirts and incorporating it into every script so that they are either the artist or the song on the shirt. Mm -hmm. Yeah. When you watch this season and I really worked hard, like it was, a, it was like, I added a lot of work to my already existing workload yeah. because it was like trying to find the right song or the right artist that Amazon legal and Sony legal would give a clearance to for us right. to use, but at the same time matches with what's going on in the script, either in Mother's Milk's life or mm -hmm. in the show. Yeah. You know, and so when you see each show, look at his shirt and it's gonna give you a slight little hint. As uh, to see, what see, that's the type of stuff I love, man. I love when you have those subtle things. Like I just, I just wrapped up Ozark and there, like there was an episode like they said where Ruth was listening to Illmatic throughout the whole episode. And like to, I know a lot of people, they probably just like, like what is going on? But when you watch that episode and you understand like the song choices that they use for per scene, it's like, yo, this makes perfect sense. So I love those little small Easter eggs. Like when you see something like that, that is like the theme of the show and stuff like, like I love that. So I mean, I'm, I'm definitely going to be looking for, but here's the thing you touched on something where you're talking about like the sneakers and how much that you put into it. If you think about like most of our great characters and it's, this is something that again, the, the culture, we understand, but a lot of people probably didn't because we always had the debate who had the better kicks, Martin or or uh, Will Smith, right? But what's funny is I interviewed Kadeem Hardison and he was like, everybody's sleeping on Dwayne Wayne. Why ain't nobody throw me in there? And then when you look back, you're like, yo, he did have a whole lot of dope kicks. And so wow. it was like, that's something that the culture we understand. Like when we see somebody with fresh kicks or we like uh, that scene, and we would have seen, we were like, that makes sense. We understand because we understand how much importance we put in those kicks. Think about when uh, when they was doing the Miles Morales. I don't know how up you're on, on Spider-Man, but they had changed it uh, in the in the new Spider-Verse that's coming out. They changed them from the Jordan 1s to some classic Adidas. Now, both shoes are top tier, but right. he would always sit with that Jordan 1 and it became this big thing. And I saw a lot of people like, who cares about the kicks? And I'm like, the culture cares. We the care. Culture cares. The culture absolutely cares. <laughs> like, yeah. Yeah. And that's the thing is like, we understand that the culture cares. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And so like, and so Kripke, Kripke stepped away. He said, all right, you know what? I'm stepping back. Yeah. That's on y'all. My name is Bennett. 
<laughs> y'all pick the kicks and yep. y'all pick the shirts. Right. I'll just approve them. You know, if, if Sony has a problem with approving yeah. them or whatever, we will talk about it. But yeah, so that's that's really what what it became. It became an Easter egg moment. Yeah. To really define through hip hop what's going on in each episode and what's going on in the story. Yeah, that's so dope. That's so dope. So I know you got like a lot of like hip hop homies that you rock with. Is, is there people hitting you up like, hey, yo, man, you should rock my shirt on this. Like, is people hitting you up trying to lobby themselves for your sh for Mother's Milk to wear their shirt? <laughs> you know what? Not, not lobby, but I'm going to tell you, man, a lot of artists have thanked me. Mm. For now, rocking that's dope. Now, that's dope. You know? Like yeah. I did. I did a couple episodes on uh, Power, on Power Book. Yep. With Method Man. Yes, you did. And uh, and it was crazy to go on set and, you know, I'm a fan of meth. You know, I'm a fan of Wu-Tang. Yeah. You know, and have him tell me how much of a fan he is of the boys and uh, uh, Mother's Milk. And he thanked me for rocking the Wu-Tang shirt. And yeah. I was like, man, like I, it never clicked in my mind that I would one day be on set with meth and that me rocking that Wu-Tang shirt, which was purely out of a fan of a, of a, of a fanboy moment. Like I had to rock a Wu Tang shirt. Ain't no way in the world I'ma rock New York hip hop right. and not rock Wu Tang. Not like that's sacrilegious. Yeah. And um and to see his appreciation, I was like, man, like th this is much deeper than just a t-shirt. Yeah. And so I share all those moments with Eric Kripke. You know, like I went to uh to 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 Snoop's uh, birthday party last year. Uh, I don't remember if it was, I'm not sure if it was his 50. I'm not going to say it was because I don't want to add age to school. Right. <laughs> but it was a big birthday party. It was yeah. like a big milestone birthday party. And uh, and he pulled me aside, man. And he literally talked to me for like 10 minutes about how much he loves Mother's Milk. He was quoting lines. Yeah. He was talking about, you know, my shirts and all that. And I was like, you know, and, and stuff like that, it just makes you think like, man, like, how can I, how can I build on this? Yeah. How can I take these legends who love this show and support it and now utilize, you know, that support and that fan base. Right. You know, to really like infuse it into the show. Yeah. But um, see, but this is where it comes full circle. You know, before we started the episode, I told you like one of the reasons why we started this is because we love this geek space, but we felt like there wasn't a lot of people that look and sound like us. Right. And so throughout yeah. this journey, I've been interviewing, you know, our heroes. I've been interviewing just, you know, just black actors and black actresses, all you know, and comic book creators and everything. And the one thing that I realized is that like everybody has a little bit of geek in them. Right. And everybody loves. It. So it's like, you know, like he's like, I love when I get to have an interview with somebody who people don't think, right? You know what I'm saying? So like, you know, like I when I when I interviewed Van Lathan at that time, everybody wanted to ask him about checking Kanye. But me and him had nothing but a, a hour-long conversation about comic books. I interviewed O'Shea Jackson Jr. And everybody was like, oh, this, this Cube son, you know, he's going to have some, some crazy Compton stories. And he just talked about video games and his love for Sonic and anime. And so it's stuff like that. It was like, you're having these conversations with Snoop. And we all know, we all know Method Man's love for comic books and, and stuff like that. And just like, I, and I think that you talk so much about uh, pushing Afrofuturism. And I was telling you, that's why we love you and the stuff that you do, but it's like, you are adding to it. Like everything that you do adds to the, the accomplishment of black people in these realms. And that's why people have so much of a, uh, uh, so much love for the mother's milk character. And then again, we all know like Wu-Tang is like, like the big, one of the, like that logo is so big. And the fact that it keeps on getting put in, shows and in movies and here and here you that like that w is going to live on forever if whoever the next people of of earth like that like that's going to be like the hieroglyphics like what is this sign like why did it mean so much and so it's like you're adding to that lore so i think that that's why so many celebrities and just other people because they get to tap into their geek side and it's like yo we got somebody else that is helping pushing that and so it's like yeah man that's super dope to see that come full circle like that yeah, now my, my goal now is to take um, everything that I have learned that works in our genre and figure out how to take it to the next level. Oh, yeah. You know what I'm saying? How to create more content and more uh, shows or movies mm -hmm. that, that really highlight Afrofuturism. And that's what really excites me yeah. right now about this opportunity being on a show like this on Amazon's platform 
is that black people are so universal. It's not just in the U.S. Yeah. It's all over the world, man. Yes, it like, is, man. You know, you go to Colombia, you go to Brazil, you go to Panama, you go to Haiti, Dominican Republic. I mean, you really don't even have to leave New York. Right. And you'll see, you know, go to Washington Heights and you'll see a thousand different black people speaking a thousand different languages or having a thousand different accents, but we're all connected by one thing and that's our melanin. Yes. But everybody has a different story to tell based on where we were brought up by who we were brought up what culture our parents were from or grandparents were from that brought us up but at the end of the day what we all have in common is that thread that connects us all yeah and so my goal is to tell stories that speak to us all but still incorporate the uniqueness yeah of of how black people are not monoliths but yet we all have a very shared experience yeah and how it's empowered us. You know, a lot of times when we look at black stories, we look at how in spite of abuse, we were able to survive. Yep. I would like to now take it to the next level yep. and say, yeah. okay, now this is where we've gone to from here. We know where we came from. Right. But now this is how that has translated, you know, into the future. Yep. You know, whether it's through powers, uh, whether it's through spirituality, Yep. Or whether it's through supernatural events, mm -hmm. you know, that we survived and maybe somebody didn't. And now we got to figure out what to do next. You know, it's it's like there's so many places to go yeah. with, with it. And, and, and what I find exciting is uh, is being able to just like, you know, just take the blinders off and say, mm -hmm. all right, let's create. Yeah, man. I you know, love that. That's really what I've been spending all my time, man, since we wrapped The Boys. I've been in the lab with uh, one of my boys, Benny Richburg, who um, he was once uh, uh, the, the showrunner for um, uh, Martin, the Martin Show. Okay. And also, uh, Prince, Prince of Bel Air and Jamie Foxx Show. Mm -hmm. And so we've just been in the lab, man. He's one of my best friends. You know, we, we, we've been boys for, for years, but we just never actually, we did work together once on this show. The um, the Flex Alexander show. Oh, and, uh, not wait. Which which one? What, not one on one. One one on one, and then okay. it spun off into a barbershop. Yeah, the barbershop one cuts. Yeah, so yeah, cuts exactly. Yeah. So I was on the original pilot for cuts. Okay. But when it got picked up, uh, they really didn't see my character fitting in, so they cut my character out of the series, and it was the best thing that could have happened to me because I ended up doing Jarhead. And ah. become boys with Jamie Foxx after that. And then from yeah. there, Jarhead, then, you know, everything, you know, yeah. uh, Avatar and everything else. Oh, but, yeah. you know, uh, Benny and I met way back then. Mm -hmm. And so now we've come together and we started just building and chopping it up and jotting some things down. And so it's like, it, it, it to me, it's so exciting to, um, to, to almost to, to give life, you know, to a whole new concept of what, uh what we look like oh, in, man, see, in the future yeah man see and that's that's one of the things like so like our collective man we've been doing this podcast for going on five years now right and we evolved like so when we started interviewing people and now we're working on an actual documentary called the black geek documentary we announced it uh we got we was fortunate enough to be interviewed by forbes and we announced it that we're doing this documentary now we're crowdsourcing it because we just for we just four blurs from milwaukee really no funding like even this and this is why i was telling your people i was so excited to have you here Right now, we are a podcast that has no network. We have no backing. So it's like everything that you've seen us done or, or your people have seen us done that let them say this would be a good interview. Uh, it was literally just us. It was, and, wow. and I've been reaching. So it's like, I feel super blessed to be able to get people like yourself on here, right? Because I get to hear these stories and we're, 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 part of the Black Geek documentary when we uh, when we film it and how we want to do it is we want to talk about, and like, we want to celebrate our heroes. We want to talk about how we love Steve Urkel and the Black Ranger and Static Shock at that time. But we also want to talk about how they 
try to box us in to be this specific geek. And then, but also talk about the exact thing stuff that you're talking about, how now, no, we are moving it to the, fo- to, to the future. I want to talk about the impact of Jordan Peele and the impact of like even the creators like King Vader and what he's been doing with the Blur Space or RDC world. And we want to talk about all of that. And that's what we realized it was like this black geek culture, even though Blur, the name Blur has been around probably like 10 years, this been within us for as long as we can remember. We just never had anybody timeline it. And instead of lo- instead of letting people that don't look like us and sound like us timeline it, I said, let us be it. Let us do it. So now we're just on this journey and doing it. But I love that because it's like the one thing that I keep on telling people as I pitch this to them, you know, just when I'm talking to investors or, or just people in general, I tell them, I said, just talk to black people and ask them just about like their geek origins. And you will hear that everybody is pushing the same thing. We are all trying to change that narrative of what we, of what the world thinks we are. Y'all think can that. I give you, can I give you a, uh, a uh, suggestion? Of course. Do a quick little one minute or three minute sizzle reel of every celebrity and regular person that you can find and even film some, maybe go out in Milwaukee on the town and interview black people. Yeah. Talking about a little bit of that, uh, of, of geekness. Oh yeah. We, so we, we did a, we did a GoFundMe trailer that we, that, that, okay. that has that. So, but, but cool. no, but no, we're going, we're going to do some more because like there's all these like blurred conventions. We're going to go down there, but it was, just, I just love when I talk to people like yourself, like we're doing it on our level. You're doing it on your level. I talked yes. to some like animators who are doing it on the animated side in the background. Yes. So I'm just like, yo, this is so dope. Like in the next five to 10 years, it's just going to look and like the world is going to be, it's just going to explode open because of completely different, man. I mean, the way that uh, black people, and I say black people because I'm not only saying African-Americans, I'm saying black people worldwide, worldwide. Yeah. uh, The stories that we love to see aren't just comedies. And at one time, that's all people thought we wanted. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, all right, we need to do a black movie comedy. Yeah. We love comedies. That's that's a given, but we're also open to the Jordan Peels. Yeah. You know, we're also open to horror. We're open to, I mean, do you know how big black Twitter was when it came to Game of Thrones? Man, bro, all, all the all the memes. Bro, bro, not even that. Anim dude, the, the amount of black Twitter that loves anime. Like we are, we love and you can see it in my background. We are like anime buffs. So and, and that's the thing. It was like I, I we want I want to uncover it. I want people to see that, like, no, and look at and look at this black, this this black joy that we have of these fandoms. There's so many people who love Star Wars, like you say, Game of Thrones, like I said, anime, comic books, like it's so many historians within this in, in this room. And that's why that's why I say I love talking to people who people don't expect you know I, like i think one of my most like shocking interviews i don't know how familiar you are with the producer drummer boy but um yeah and so drummer boy i mean he's this trap producer but he also has high accomplishments in it but when we was talking about video games i had so many people like i didn't even think drummer boy was into that type of stuff i'm like yeah no we all have that because remember that was also an escape for us like growing up for where we grow up, you know what I'm saying? And where we at, we, you know, we, we, we lean on sports, but we also lean in on video games. If you, if you were a, a person who got into comic books, you lean into comic books. That's that Saturday morning cartoons as kids watching Power Rangers and Dragon Ball Z and, and all those animes, like stuff like that. It was like, we have that. We just really never really had a chance to really talk about it, you know, in full, because like you said, they only want to give us comedies. You know, they want to get lot, for, for a lot of parents, uh, video games was a way to keep their kids off the streets. Man, I swear. You know I mean? So, I mean, it was the type of thing where it was like, okay, you know what? He's sitting in front of that TV for two hours, but for two hours, I know mm-hmm. he ain't outside getting in, tr- in trouble. Exactly. You know? so it's, it's so many things that, that culturally uh, impacted the way that we became a part of pop culture and then once we became a part of this pop culture, mm-hmm. then we created our own version of it. And that became pop culture. Yep. You know what I'm saying? And so it, it just it just shows how influential um, we can be as a collective. And it also shows that there's so much room for growth. There's yeah. so much room for growth to give more because that consumer base is just fiending mm-hmm. you know, for more material. Yeah, exactly. So-
Like everybody has the stereotypical on what a black geek is. Are you familiar with the term blurred? Blurred, no. Right. Some people said it came off of scrubs. Some people said it came off the internet. I don't honestly really know. Ah, don't you see the skin? The eyebrows, the hair. Yo, white geeks still rock, you know what I'm saying, dunks or, or Jordans or whatever. Did I do that? It's, it's exciting. It's like, holy, oh my dog is going to start barking. Um, <laughs> it's all right. <laughs> she's excited about it too. Um, and uh, same as you said, like a barbershop talk, like we would go into really in-depth conversations <laughs> about these theories and like, well, what if and how come? It's not on you, she wants to be Right, but we we talk about anime, video games, comic books, and stuff like that. But when you hear us talk about it, the passion sounds like we arguing Jordan and Braun. Hey, what, what do you mean? What does that even Rick. mean? Talk Rick, us. What does Rick. that even mean? Like it sounds like barbershop talk. You don't know the history. Don't mean it ain't happened, huh? <laughs> Broke that down right there. <laughs> but. When you see the black geek, you don't see that. You see the socially awkward glasses. Well, this is me. And that's not a lot of us. A lot of us do sound and talk like us. You know what I'm saying? Because it becomes stereotypical, as if that's where our strength comes from. I, I, I don't know the geek that you talking that you that you talked about before. I know the geek you're talking about right now, though. It, I, it was sort of a call sign so we could find each other on message boards. Anime gives you life lessons throughout that whole thing. Like, there's not one anime that I know of that doesn't teach you to never give up. It's just like, I just love seeing us go into the world and go into these different spaces and create things that weren't there before. And then it was like, Miles Morales is like the normal, you know, black person in the United States. That was my first, like, blurred moment was seeing, you know, Storm on the X-Men cartoon series. And I was like, wow, that's a black woman and she's strong, she's powerful. That's what I want for us. I want us to be that voice. So one of my one of my biggest regrets in life is that I didn't go to an HBCU, and I know that you are, um, that you and and you're very proud and you push it a lot. But I love again the one thing I love about HBCUs outside of just the representation. I love how much you you guys give back to the community, how much you guys are on representation and everything. Now, um, I. I try to, I stray away from controversy. I don't, I don't ever want to put an actor in a bad situation, but I did want to ask you a specific question because we know last year we had a situation with Insecure and about a character who, uh, an actor uh, who, who was not an HBCU portraying HBCU member on camera. Now we don't got to talk about that situation specifically, but did, I wanted to actually have a conversation with somebody and say, how can Hollywood respectfully portray a HBCU on screen without it getting so much controversy. Like in your, like, what do you like? What is the proper way to do that? So I think I think if I remember correctly, it was an an actor on Insecure that was portraying being in a sorority. Yes, 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 yes. Yeah, in correct. An African American historical sorority who yes. was not correct. That. So, just for context, uh, I was in a movie called Snap the Yard. Yeah, she was, man. <laughs> and that's like a cult classic, too. <laughs> it's a cult classic. Now, in Stomp the Yard, uh, Stomp the Yard was produced by Will Packer, mm -hmm. who is a member of Alpha Phi Alpha, right. Fraternity Incorporated. Um, and his producing partner uh, is also an Alpha. They pledged, I believe, together or at the same uh, campus. Okay. Uh, it's a ski uh, at Florida A&M, Florida a I believe. Um, now, uh, Nobody in that film, the majority of us in that film were not from a sorority or a fraternity. Okay. Now the fraternities and sororities in that film, because of legal purposes, we were not able to use the real HBCU fraternity okay. um, in the film. We had to make our own up. Okay. So we made up ones that were as similar as possible to the real ones. You know? okay. So ours were the wolves, mm -hmm. which if you think about it, it's very similar to the Omegas, yep. to the Qs. Um, they're Q dogs. We were the Moo Gamma Wolves. You know, you had 
uh, Columbus Short and uh, uh, Brian's fraternity, which was the um, Thetas. The Thetas, yep. Who were really, if you think about it, Thetas, Alphas. You know yep. what I'm saying? So they were more similar to the Alphas, their color scheme, all that stuff. And their behavioral patterns, like a lot right. of the, we tried to mold them as similar as possible. People in, in, in from HBCUs, they knew mm -hmm. who we were. Uh, right, right. Portray. Um, I, I feel like we are, are actors. We do not have to be murderers to play a murderer. We do not have to be a, a uh, child molester to play the role of a child molester. Uh, we don't have to be the president of the United States to one day portray the president of the United States. Our job is to study, mm -hmm. to learn, to uh, in, in, imitate, okay. um, to, to embody the character as closely as possible, as respectfully as possible, as yep. accurately as possible. Yep. Um, and if we accomplish that, then we have accomplished our goal, our task that we were given. Mm -hmm. um, people should not feel offended by our portrayal. If they do feel offended by our portrayal, then at that point, um, it's something that we need to find out. What was it about my performance that offended this group of people? Right. If a whole big group of people are offended. And you can't say, okay, that whole big group of people is crazy. You gotta oh, find out yeah. what didn't they like. But right. you gotta also remember that it's, it's bigger than just in the actor's hands. There's a writer. Mm -hmm. who, you know, no matter how much you negotiate and try to rewrite your lines, if the writer wants you to say these words, those are the words you're going to have to say. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? There's a director who, again, as an intelligent actor, um, and if they respect you, you should be able to let the director know, you know, I really, it says it play it this way, but I really don't think that's the best way to play it. I want to play it this way. And, you know, because like anger, you can play anger with a smile on your face. Yeah. You can play anger with tears in your eyes. You can play anger aggressively. You mm -hmm. can play anger so many different ways. Same mm -hmm. thing with sadness. Same thing with insecurity. Same thing with happiness. Right. So uh, there's so many different people involved um, that you can't just point the finger at the actor only and say it's their fault because mm -hmm. of the way that we were depicted right. or portrayed. You know, if they're... If, if they're representing a stereotype of that sorority or fraternity that is um, that 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 is inaccurate and and it's almost offensive, yeah. yeah. I mean, if people yeah. are upset, it's um, it's to be expected. Yeah. But you can't just blame one person. Correct. They yeah. didn't create that one character and say, "I'm going to play it this way." I don't care what the director says or the creator says or the showrunner says. This is how I'm. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. But it's a little unfair to point the finger at one person. Um, and I don't think you have to be from the sorority or the fraternity to play them as long as you do your part. You know, Martin, I mean, um, uh, uh, Will Smith played Ali. He wasn't a boxer. Right. But he played, he played a boxer. Part, yeah. you know, he just played uh, King Richard. He wasn't uh, Serena Williams and, and, and Venus's dad, but mm -hmm. he played that, you know? Yeah. So uh, I think sometimes, you know, People got to remember that it's it's make believe. Mm -hmm. It's not real. Yeah. And we're doing our best to try to make it as real as possible and capture mm -hmm. as much of it as possible. Um, but if for some reason in that process you end up offending some folks, then you should try to find out what is it about it that offended them. Yeah. You know. And, and, and at that point, then you can then you can determine. Okay. Well, based on what people are saying. It's not the performance that offended him. It's the depiction, which yeah, depiction, yeah. I mean, the writers, how they depicted this character. Yeah. You know, so. And so, and, you know, and, and, and thank you for that, because I, I try to stray away from talking about stuff that I don't 100 percent know about. Right. And I remember and, 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 and shout out to Issa Rae and Princess Penny, because if I'm not mistaken, I do believe that they reached out to the sorority and talk to them and handle it behind the scenes. And like I said, us as fans, we don't need to know what that conversation was about. But it, 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 it posed, cause like when I remember, you know, every podcast, we, we was podcast during that time, everybody want to talk about it. I said, I really don't have any opinion on it because I don't know, like I said, cause in, to, from a fan standpoint, 
I only portrayed it to like, I only equate it to like, as long as they're portraying this in a good light, then that should be okay. But I was like, but it's obviously maybe something a little bit more to it. And I said, so I said, I can't really speak on it. So I, I, you're, you're the first person I really had a chance to really dive deep into it in regards to it. But it was like, it was, that's what I, I just wanted to understand. Like, okay. The thing is, is the this, thing too is, is because I went to an HBCU, you don't have to be in a fraternity or sorority to know the do's and don'ts. Right. <laughs> I already know. It's right. Of course. I just cannot of do course. Of course. or say or repeat because I'm not a member of that fraternity or sorority. And if you do, you're going to have to answer to somebody. You're going to have to answer to that. Yeah. I already know there are certain shirts that I cannot wear or color combinations that if I do wear them, I am implying that I am a member of that organization. Yeah. And if I wear it, let's say, to the gym, that's one thing. But if I wear it on Howard's campus during uh, uh, homecoming, oh man, it's <laughs> something different. Yeah, you know what I'm saying. So uh, it's it's the type of thing where if Prentice and Issa Rae did not attend a HBCU and they're not members of these organizations, then they might not know some of the don'ts mm -hmm. that may have offended people. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And a lot like I remember when I did Stomp the Yard. When I did Stomp the Yard, and I hosted a bunch of events afterwards, uh, just as a, as a as Laz Alonzo, not as Stomp the Yard. Yeah. But like a lot of Greeks thought I was a Kappa. So the minute I would get on stage, everybody would start throwing up the Kappa signs mm -hmm. and yelling the Kappa call. Yeah. And I knew no matter how many thousands of people were excited and happy throwing up the sign, you couldn't throw it back. Time, I'm not gonna throw it back. I'm not, I'm not gonna give you the call back. Yeah. And I would, and I would throw up the Moo Gamma sign. Uh -huh. And I would do the Moo Gamma joint. Yeah. And they would laugh, and they would all like you know. But I, you know, it, it's a it's a certain uh, language that you learn on an HBCU's campus yeah. that you also learn even if you are not in one of the historically uh oh, yeah yeah colleges i mean um uh fraternities and sororities you know okay i can't do that <laughs> yeah oh yeah you're gonna have to see somebody hey or that's that's 100 why i didn't talk about it on the podcast when people say i was like listen here man I, so I had a moment i this is like me like very very young i think i was a freshman and i went to like the first like one of the first parties that i went to that had college people there and, and it was the line right yeah. And me, I'm like, all right, I, I want to get over to the room. And I was like, I'm, I'm going to let them do their thing. But then, like I said, it was going for quite some time. And I was like, all right, I, I got to get through. And I got through, and it almost turned to a brawl because I'm like, fam, I'm just trying to get through. Y'all wow. been doing this for a long, but I didn't wow. know. I didn't know. And so it was like, but that, and you know, it took it took my guy, he, put, he like, he he calmed everything down. And he was like, look, let me, let me put you up on game on what this is. You know, and so, and after that, and like, but that's the thing. It's like once you gain the knowledge, then you know. So if you do it again, now it's definitely disrespect. That's actually but, a scene in Stomp the Yard where Kamala comes and breaks through our line, and all yeah. hell breaks loose. Yeah, don't break that line, man. Don't break that line. You need to walk a block to get around. It. You, need to walk a block. <laughs> you ain't breaking this line, not right here. Right. <laughs> but like I said, I, but I, you know, saying like I said, I, 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 I learned it. I, I, you know, what I'm saying I understand it, and, you know, and that's why I said looking back, I'm just like, man, I wish I would have, I would have went down that path because I love everything that you guys stand for, everything, the brotherhood, the 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 community aspect, looking out for people, like I just you love. Know what? It. I'm gonna be honest with you, man. Blur, blur, being part of the blurred community is in many ways also its own HBCU, you know, and you happen to be one of the founding members of your own HBCU. You know, like after we graduate, we all kind of hold on to a little piece of what it is to be from an HBCU. And really it's just community, man. Mm -hmm. That's really all it is, it's just community. And homecomings become that one day a year where we all come back and, and relive that experience. Yeah. But outside of that, whatever community that you can create that highlights and uplifts each other because that's all the that HBCU did. It was four years of constant upliftment of each other. Yeah. It's four years where your color will not be used against you. Yeah. It's four years where you do not have to not only not defend being black, but not explain being black. And where being black is almost like for four years, you are in a fantasy land, a utopia, mm -hmm. where there is no privilege or no holdbacks for being black 
you're just another human being on around another, another set of human beings. And the only thing you're judged on is how smart you are or how talented you are or how uh, athletic you are or how famous you are or how good looking you are. Everything except having to defend your blackness. Yeah. And you would not believe how free and liberating that is when you are in an environment where day in and day out, blackness is not something that can be used against you. You don't even think about it. It's, it's insane how we're so conditioned to live in a world where we're conscious of our blackness every day we step out the house. You know, and we have to make our children conscious of it too in order for them to make it back home safely. And when you're on an HBCU campus for four years, you're, you don't have to be conscious of it. It, it, it. it opens up your mind. It reduces so much anxiety and stress. And it allows you the freedom to just be great. Oh, man, I love it. Unapologetically. And, and I, think, I think that's what makes it, the HBCU experience special. No, man, I think, man, I didn't even think about it that way, man. That's That was a dope comparison. All right, so we got two more seconds before I get you out of here, man. Sure. So you being a hip-hop historian, uh, you're going to hate this question, but I got to ask, what is your top five albums? Now, I'll give you a caveat. It doesn't have to be in order, and it can be just currently right now, because I know most hip-hop historians, it changes. But if you had to choose five hip-hop albums, what are you choosing? Um, It's tough to choose five albums because... Um, hip hop is such a part of my life's journey mm -hmm. that um, while certain albums in times of my life have really consumed every single day, every song played, um, that shifts as my life shifts. Yeah. So I'm gonna I'm gonna say artists. Okay, let's do let's do artists. Yeah. Um, so artists, I feel like, of course, Biggie Smalls. Yep. Because Biggie Smalls, when he came out, it was when I was learning what it was to go from being a boy to a man. And so that chip on his shoulder, I, I absorbed that chip on his shoulder. Um, when I was growing up as a kid, it was LL. Ooh. I feel like every kid, when they're kids, they have an artist that they look up to that they kind of identify with. And for me, it was LL. Okay. You know, it wasn't like the, the lip licking. <laughs> Although I do, you know, but, but it's also like the being in shape, the working out, yeah. you know, like my tongue is like a shark's fin, you know, and I like, you know, all, all, all that stuff. My head is like a shark's fin. Yeah. All, all his bravado, I felt like I needed it to survive growing up in D.C. when I grew up in D.C. during that era. Okay. And that kind of like wearing that that macho thing helped me go from being, all right, you know what, when I step into these streets, you are either prey or you're predator, you know? And predator doesn't necessarily mean you're going after anybody, or you're hunting down people. Right. It just means y'all ain't gonna take me down, not without a fight. Right. And, and, if, and if I lose the fight, then I'm running. Because predator, predators are fast too. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm you know, But, but it, it, it taught me how to um, carry myself in a way that, would allow me to survive in pretty much any situation, yeah. you know, without having to engage in order to prove myself. Okay. Um, so LL, when I was a kid, I say from there, Biggie Smalls took over when I was going from boyhood to manhood. Um, uh, at one point in my life, I would say public enemy definitely That's uh, uh, forced me to learn. I would say Howard when I was at Howard, okay. um, so this was before Biggie Smalls, uh, Public Enemy taught me that being black came with responsibility. Oh, yes. You know I, what I'm saying? I, I, see, I see that connection for sure. You know, that, there was, that yeah. there was something bigger to being black than just yourself. Yeah. You don't just represent yourself. And yeah. that's something to this day. Like whenever I take on a character, I understand that I'm not just representing myself. I if, I, if, I, if I portray a very, very, very piece of crap black man with no context, you know, you have to add context and yeah. details. So much, so many details to the point where people say that character was, was horrible. Not, ooh, black men are horrible. Because let's be honest, a lot of places that see our films yeah. may have never met a black person in their lives. This might be the first time they might only see black people through film and television. Yeah. 
So if we don't do our work as actors, and that's why I like, it's so important for me for actors to really take their job seriously, their responsibility. It ain't just regurgitating somebody else's words. You have to really put in that work yeah. before you step on stage and make this character so distinct that people can't say all black men are rapists. No, that particular one was a rapist. Mm -hmm. And it's so unique and so specific that nobody would ever think all black men are like that. Yeah, yep. You know what I'm saying? So uh, Public Enemy taught me that I represent more than just myself. Um, then came Biggie. Uh, you know what? Uh, believe it or not, Rick Ross. Oh, okay. Is somebody that I really have uh, have learned. A, I'm so incredibly impressed with him. Shaq too, but so incredibly impressed with what he's done outside of rap. Oh yeah, yeah. With his wing stops. Yes, yeah. And it just has shown me that no matter what we do, we have to diversify and we have to learn how to make our money work as well. Mm -hmm. We can't just we can't just be earners. Right. We can't just only be workers. We have to learn how to invest, how to take risk, how to put our money somewhere so that it works while we're over here working. Our money is doing something else over here. Right. You know, so he has definitely uh, inspired me through all of his grandeur and how he talks. But he walks the walk. 50 Cent, too, to be honest with you. Yeah, man. What, what are you doing with over at, at that power verse, man? Like, yeah. I was I, I was on a podcast, uh, and it was we were talking about it. I was telling I was like, no matter how you feel about power, 50 Cent is making and giving Black people just giving so many starts to Black people, giving so many good looks to Black people. And like I said, like, I, I'm I, I'm still all in. I, I, I just got done watching Force. Like, I'm still all in. So I'm like, but it was just like, I love what 50 is doing just for Black actors and giving giving people those chances. And, you know, even like rappers, it, it was always a hard, like, it was always, like, it was always just that one, that one rapper that jumped over. And 50, here's 50 giving multiple rappers he got joey badass in there he giving gravy an opportunity when he was like, like he's just giving artists artists opportunities to be in shows method man and mary j blige leading in a show it's like you he's just giving these artists all this opportunity and i, I just love this art but not just artists real actors too. oh yeah real actors too yeah 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 black directors yeah writers, oh, writers. he's giving a lot of people opportunities so you know there's there's a lot of uh hip-hop um that that has influenced me. Okay. It's still part of my influence. So I said, P E L L Rick Ross, um, Biggie. And I got one more, right? You said yep. five. Yep. Uh, Hmm. Todd. You know, uh, Jay Z, um, again, same reason, uh, same reason Rick Ross. Mm hmm. Is because oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. what he has done as far as a business mogul, man, is just it blows my mind. Mm -hmm. Um, and I feel like he also uh likes to work with fellow uh, artists and and, and 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 black folks, you know, this movie he just did, uh the cowboy movie. Oh yeah, uh oh, my heart of they yeah. fall. Heart of they fall. Oh my god, you such a good movie. You see what I'm saying? So it's like I, I just I just really love how outside of the box he thinks. I just wish he did more music still. I feel like he still has a lot of music left in him. Yes, he does. But every time he pops up, you're like, fam, keep going. <laughs> listen, listen, no offense to Drake, because I, I really love Drake and, mm -hmm. and what he does. I don't think Drake has ever put out a brick. I don't think he's put out a brick album or a brick song. Right. But my favorite song on Drake's last album uh, is with him and Jay-Z. Yeah. And Jay Z literally ate that song. Man, up. I think yeah. after after he had Eminem feature him on a song, I think Jay realized I can never be on a song with nobody. Right. <laughs> I can do that shit to me again. Right. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And, yeah. and so he he came in that joint, and I mean he ripped that joint. And Drake did his thing too. Oh yeah. You know I, I'm not saying anything. I'm not comparing him, but but Jay Z ate that thing up, and it just made me think listening to this song. 20 times in a row really makes me want a Jay-Z yeah. album right now. Yeah. You know what? Because you actually have actual history in Wall Street, just through, you know, college and everything like that. And your, you know, your just job immediately after it. And knowing Jay-Z and how much he is about like creating these black stories, 
you know what would be a dope thing? And I don't know if it's out there, if, you, if there's even a script or anything, but um, the story of Robert F. Smith, you know, the uh, like, he's like- yeah. Actually, if, I just saw somebody optioned it. Oh, they did? Bro, somebody you you it. you would be perfect casting for that. Like, you know what I'm saying? Cause like, I didn't even got, think about that. You know, that's the first book I read coming out of college. Oh man, see, and I think that if 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 they portray that and put something, because I again, that's that's another thing, just being able to see that representation in area in fields. For the fact that he was such a monster in, on Wall Street, and yep. that story has not been told like in like in in a theatrical sense yet, I would love to see that on screen. Why should white for, guys have all the fun? That was amazing. right. <laughs> I would um, love for you to be up to play that role. All right, so last. Wood, man. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, Make some phone calls. Yeah, but uh, all right. So, um, last segment it could be a recommend. It's recommendations. Something that you're reading, you're watching, you're listening to. It doesn't have to be all three. It could be any one. But something that you think that our listeners should check out. Um, I think that our listeners should check out investment podcasts. Ooh, yes. Uh, there's a black one right now. Two young, two brothers. What are their names? Um, I can't remember right now. They've gotten so hot in like the last year. Since the pandemic, they've blown up. Right. Um, I'm gonna try to remember it and get back to you. Yeah, because yeah, I put. I'll, I'll oh, oh, earn your leisure. Earn your leisure. Earn your leisure. Okay. Earn okay. your leisure. Yeah. And I, you know, I just really think that um, you know, watching uh, how money is made. Yeah. And we have been taught by our parents who taught us to get a job and to save. That's what the previous generations did. They got jobs, they worked, and they saved. And I think that what, what now the new generation is learning is that there's a step more than that. Yeah. That's investing. Yeah. That's instead of saving it over here, save a little bit, mm -hmm. take this other little bit and have that money now working for you. Yeah. And making you money. And I really want to see Black folks investing. You know, because uh, I remember I did a show for American Airlines uh, 10 years ago, inspiring black folks to travel, get a passport and travel. And now when you look at Instagram, everybody's right. traveling somewhere. Everybody's right. somewhere exotic. So now I think that's the next thing. Have your investments pay for that travel. Dope, dope. You know what I'm saying? I, I, like I said, we I've been doing these interviews for two years. And the one thing that I love about it is every time that I ask the uh the black guest specifically, like recommend something. It's either a book or some or like I said, like an investment podcast, but it's something to better either your mental or your or your space, right? And it's funny because I'm like, I it's it's one of those small things that I've I've taken a lot of pride into because I didn't I didn't give you a caveat. I didn't tell you ahead of time to choose this, but it's just something that it's like like you said, we're not monolith, but we're all on that same wavelength. Like, yeah, we can have fun, we can joke, we can do all of this, but let's not forget we still need to advance as much as we can as people and I love that everybody's giving recommendations like that. It's one of those small things that I pride being able to have without even having to like set it up. Like I just love that, man. So uh, one last the one last question. So I, obviously I know you can't give much, but what can we expect from this season of the boys? So this season of the boys, the one thing I can say is that you're gonna get a lot of mother's milk. Mm -hmm. uh, it is the season where you know last season they focused on. Uh, uh, Frenchie's backstory. So yep. we learned his origin story. We learned where he came from and, and why he is the way he is. Yeah. And this season, uh, they decided to give Mother's Milk his origin story and give you some tidbits as to even his name. Like, why is he called Mother's Milk? Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Where all that came from, his family, right. where he's yeah. from. Like, why is he the way he is? You know, you're going to learn why he is who he is. Cool, cool. and how it how it it's also connected very much to this season okay. the shit that's happening awesome so nope. it's it's a great season for for us to really like get more connected to the character mm -hmm. and, and and who he is and why he is all right cool 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 and if you're watching this the boys return back on june 3rd right yes june 3rd man make sure you guys tune on in prime and video amazon prime video y'all dropping like the first two episodes right you know what? I think it's the first three, but don't. Oh, the me. first three? Okay, okay. I think it's the first three, but I'm not sure. All right, man. All right. So, where can my people find you at, man? 
at Laz Official on Facebook, at Laz Official on Instagram. Uh, I don't even know what my TikTok is. I barely know. <laughs> I, I don't. I, I'm, this hey, is, man, I'm, let me find out. We mothers looks out here doing the dances on TikTok. <laughs> you know what dance I do want to do? The, 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 the slide. Yeah. Hey, baby. <laughs> hey, babe. I, you gotta try it, man. Don't Everybody, freeze. Everybody done tried it. You got to, man. Don't sleep. I, 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 I'm I, going to the bathroom. Whenever I go to the bathroom, I'll be like, hey, baby, baby. Hey, baby, baby. Yeah. Hey, it's that's common. another thing. I love that it's the Black youth that are making these viral dances. Like, like that kid, man, like he, he, he captivated the world with that. And it's just so dope to see, man. I love that. Man. Man. All right, man. This is one on one with Deuces. I've been your boy Deuces. This has been the man, the myth, the legend himself. Such a well spoken man, man. It's been the homie, Laz Alonzo, and we are out. Peace. Flawless victory.